morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Linda is spearheading this um, drive today, and it's matching funds to drive that. And it's for the Leukemia Lymphoma Society. And as a family who has been considerably helped by the, the society, I just want to say that not only do they give their monies for medical breakthroughs, but they're there for the support of the whole family. They have, like I just received this in the mail yesterday, support groups every month that you can go to and you know talk to people who will tell you that everything's going to be okay. They also give um, trips to families to go to Maine or Colorado for a, um, a break, which the families need so often. The child comes and they give a one-on-one -on -one to the child, where the child goes with other patients, and then the families can go for a while. They just, they help in every area of the child's life. At Christmas time, if the child is in the hospital, they make sure that that child is receiving something for Christmas. And I don't mean something, I mean they get bikes away, they get, it's unbelievable what they do to try to make the children and the family feel comfortable. So I'm going to say, if you don't want to pick up a uh, big book, that's fine, but you can write a check to the, is it lymphoma? To, to Holy Cross. To Holy Cross. And then just put it and, in the uh, it's for the leukemia bake sale. On the bottom of it? On, on the mental part of the check. On the mental part, is you write the leukemia lymphoma um, benefit. And I will tell you, um, it's a wonderful organization. A lot of organizations give so much of their money, and then they don't help to support the families and the children. And Pastor and I are going to tell you that they do support the families. It isn't only the medical breakthroughs, although we need those. So we thank you. And I would also like to mention, I believe we're one of the busiest small churches anywhere in the country. I really do. When I look at the size of our program, the things that we cover, next Sunday is Gideon Sunday. And some of you who are traditional say, well, isn't Gideon Sunday always in the middle of the summer, sometime in June? It used to be. But Gideons have had their, co their conferences about this time of year. And they have asked if some of their best speakers could come here because they are so impressed with your response to their Gideon Sunday. So they will be coming and speaking next year, uh, next week. They'll be here next year too. They will be coming next week. If you want to plan to bring a check for Gideon, you can do that. And the Bible study will be a video and a discussion of the memorial plan that they have that has given millions of Bibles all around the world. So next Sunday, Gideons will be speaking and they will be here. So um, if you want to make plans in that direction, we would uh, bless it. Okay? We begin with the prayer. <laughs>
second Sunday of Easter. Almighty and servant God, strength of those who believe and the hope of those who doubt, may we have not seen, but faith in you and receive the fullness of Christ's blessing, to live to reign with you and the Holy Spirit. One God, now and forever. Amen. 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 In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be on your hands, please.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord.
from different parts of the world, but assembled now in Jerusalem as visitors or current, or current residents. It was the day of Pentecost, and this crowd of men had just witnessed the followers of Jesus, who had just been filled with the Holy Spirit and had been speaking in tongues. But Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and complained to them, Jewish men and all you residents of Jerusalem, let this be known to you and pay attention to my words. Men of Israel, listen to these words. This Jesus, the Nazarene, was a man pointed out to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs that God did among you through him, just as you yourselves know. Though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge, you used lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. God raised him up, ending the pains of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says of him, I saw the Lord ever before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will rest in hope, because you will not leave my soul in Hades, or allow your Holy One to see decay. You have revealed the paths of life to me. You will fill me with gladness in your presence. Brothers, I can confidently speak to you about the patriarch David. He is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn an oath to him to seek one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing this advance, he spoke concerning the resurrection of the Messiah. He was not left in Hades, and his flesh did not experience decay. God has resurrected this Jesus. We are all witnesses of this. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. The psalm we need to death is Psalm 16, and we'll read it responsibly. Protect me, God. For I take refuge in you. I said to the Lord, You are my Lord, Lord. I have no good besides I you. As for the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. The perishes, 
though we find by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You love him, though you have not seen him. And though not seeing him now, you believe in him and rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat>
and peace be unto you from God our Father and our living Lord and Savior, Jesus the Almighty Christ. Amen. Amen. And as I have blessed you, let us take a moment of silent prayer, each uniting our spirit and asking God to guide our words this morning with every head bowed and every heart open to ask the spirit of God to speak to the needs in our lives today. Let us pray. The text for our meditation today is the Gospel lesson, the 20th chapter of John, beginning with the 19th verse. And I would read it to you with the flow of the King James Version. And then the same day and evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus into the midst of and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And then Jesus said unto them again, Peace be unto you. You know, I never appreciated it until I became a police chaplain and was asked to do a death notification. And I had to go to a stranger's house. It was an 85, 86-year-old woman whose son, who was 50 years old, had unexpectedly died. She had no one in the community, so the family called the police. So somebody she knew could go to talk to her about the death of her son. She had no family in the community. So I went. And she was Jewish. And all of the training that I had in our Messianic service assisted. But for the first time I realized here was somebody who really had no vision of the resurrection. You and I, every year, <coughs> have gone through the drama of the resurrection. And we know what awaits our loved ones. Because we've been through the drama. The glory story of the resurrection. But I want to tell you, even among Christians, most people do not worry about the resurrection until the doctor tells them to call them. Most people do not care about the resurrection till the medical doctor tells them it's hospice time. Most people do not ponder the power of the resurrection until the doctor says, now is the hour. Now is the hour. Why not? Because most of us are caught in the pursuit of success. I had a, a vision of success that was shared with me that I'd like to share with you. Many people can't go after, worry about the resurrection because they're busy with success at this time. Success. At age four, success is not piddling in your pants. At age 12, success is having friends. At age 17, success is having a driver's license. At age 35, success is money. At age 50, success 
is having money. At age 70, success is having a driver's license. At age 75, success is having friends. And at age 80, success is not fiddling in your pants. It is amazing how many people never see the glory and the power of God's resurrection because they are so busy chasing the concepts of success that follow them through life. But I want to tell you, the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives eternal life to strengthen us for the infernal strife of every day. The resurrection, knowing that God is there, knowing that God does care, that resurrection gives us strength, eternal strength, for the infernal fight that life becomes. The trials, the troubles, the tribulations are strengthened because we know, we are assured, I have that blessed assurance where He is and where I'm going. And I love this text because it lays out the reality of life. And on the evening of the first day of the week when the disciples were together, it was evening. There are so many things that we see as the close of a chapter. We see them as the end. We see them as a failure. We see them as something that was terrible and darkness is descending everywhere and the vision and the view is shortening. There is so often we see things as the end of the day. And God looks and He smiles and He says, this is but the beginning of your new life. This is but the beginning of your new opportunity. This is but the beginning. We're busy looking at the end, and he's busy seeing the opening opportunity of the beginning that is there in front of us. That's why it takes the resurrection of God in Jesus Christ. He can't do anything. He, from eternal life, can handle the infernal strife that life becomes when things are confusing. And it was the first day of the week. To the Jewish people, this was ultimately important. We Christians don't make much out of it. But to the Jewish people who understood the Old Testament, this was really important. Because you have the Passover. Then after the Passover, there went a solid week, seven days of eating unleavened bread to remind them to get the sin out of their lives. Eating this matzah to remind them to get the sin out of their life. And somewhere in the middle of that seven days, there was a Sabbath. Somewhere in the middle of that seven days, there was a Sunday. Somewhere in the middle of that week, there was a first day of the week. And that first day of the week was the resurrection day for Jesus Christ because he came out with a whole new life, a whole new understanding, a whole new belief of what reality is all about. But that resurrection day, that first day, was also the beginning of when they started counting to Pentecost. That Sunday when he resurrected was when the countdown began for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to transform the world in the image of Jesus Christ. That first day of the week was the beginning of the countdown to the outpouring when Jesus in 2,000 years was going to transform all of society. And then at the end of the 2,000 years, he was going to give them a choice. Are you for me or are you against me? We see that happening in our world. Are you for me or are you against me? Are you with the culture that's slowly pushing God out of everything? Or are you standing with Him? And this first day of the week was so marvelous to them because it was the beginning of the countdown and they didn't even know that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was going to come. I've been studying for a college course I'm going to be teaching sometime in the next year. And I've been looking at all the hymns that the Essene community studied that aren't in our Bible. And one of these hymns, one of the primary ones,
ones, one of the primary psalms they had, five times says, and there will be an outpouring of tongues of fire. And so they're busy looking for the outpouring. And at Pentecost, the power of God poured down on his people and said, now go out and transform the world. But this text is for those who hadn't quite gotten the message. This was the first day of the week when the disciples were together and the doors were locked for fear. Have you ever noticed what happens when you get in the middle of a crowd of cowards? <laughs> I mean, you're feeling pretty good. You're feeling things are going to be okay. Then suddenly the doubters all come and, and the coward will have one word. You can't. No, you'll never be seen. No, don't even try. <laughs> you're ready to move forward and they're telling, oh, no, it can't. You're ready to believe God. And they're all saying, no, 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 can't. It is amazing how one rotten apple can ruin a barrel and how one collection of cowards can ruin a faith. How one collection of cowards can stop your dreams. One collection of cowards can, crimp, can cripple your life. And there it was, the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together. What happens when you put a bunch of cowards together? <laughs> yeah, cowards. And there they were, hiding out. On the verge of the greatest breakthrough that mankind had ever received from the hand of the glory of God, and there they were, cowering. And they're cowardice. And the doors were locked for fear. Have you ever noticed how fear cripples someone? Young man made the basketball shot 10,000 times. He does it in the backyard every afternoon for three hours. Then you put him in a stadium full of people. Screaming and shouting, you put him in a big game, you put him in the game of the season, you put him in the game of the year, and all of a sudden, fear just overwhelms. Chunk! And he misses for fear. And I've seen it with relationships. People have been burned once, people have been lied to once, people have been hurt once, and so they spend the whole rest of their life avoiding life, the whole rest of their life avoiding growth, the whole rest of their life avoiding opportunity because once they were burned and the fear has just festered and welled up within them. And God comes along in the face of that fear. See, the doors were locked. The door of my potential is locked by my fear. The door of my opportunity is locked by somebody else's fear. Everybody tells me the world is collapsing. And I sit there and say, the world is collapsing. And God says things can't collapse in my hand. Okay. <coughs> and God says, I'm still in control. Amen. And God says, I still understand economics. I still understand politics. I still understand leadership. <coughs> but the doors were locked. For fear. There's a lesson in there for each one of us. God never works through fear. God never calls you from a place. He always calls you to a place. God always says, this is where the feeding, this is where the leading, this is where the power is. And so many people lead just to fear. Just to stop. Because you see, their doors are locked for fear. Your doors were shut on their life because of fear. And Jesus walks into the midst. I mean, there's all these people complaining and moaning and whining and wondering and wandering. And they're all just speaking negative. And they're all speaking bad. And into the middle of the walk, Jesus, and what does he say? He says, Peace be unto you. Peace be unto you. God's power begins with peace. God's power in your life begins with the transforming power of peace. Pastor, if you live my life, I've got 10,000 people 
I need to get mad at? Well, I thank God I don't know any of those people. I thank God I don't have to talk to counsel any of those people. You see, Jesus always comes in and says, peace. You'll do better under peace. My presence is with peace. My Holy Spirit comes with peace. It's so easy to pick a fight. But in Jesus Christ, you have the power of peace. And it begins with your own heart. Begins with your own temperament. Begins with your own temper. God, I want peace. Because I want the power spiritually which comes after the peace. You see, God has the resurrection to eternal life so we can make it through the infernal strife that life is when you're living life with people who are sinning. And Jesus came into the reality. I love it when Jesus comes into the reality. Because Jesus is never content to come to your reality. He comes to your reality to transform it to his reality. He comes into your reality to transform it into his reality of peace, which leads to power. He came into their reality and he stood in the midst. They're all so fearful and they're all tearful and they're all terrified. He walks in and says, I want to give you the environment of peace. I've got it in control. And he holds out his hand and says, I've got it in control. And then they happen to notice the nail hole is still there. They happen to notice that it's still there. Look at verse 20. I like the way Brother Richard is using the computer to go to a lot of different Bible translations. And one he has been inflicting on all of us is an Australian <laughs> translation where they put in all this Australian language in the Bible, folks. But in this one, and I really like this, it says, then he showed them the deep scars in his hands You mean, Jesus, when you get to heaven, your scars aren't going to be all cleaned up? No. They're going to be there as a reminder of what I passed through. But they'll be glorified. They'll be sanctified. Do you know how many people spend all their psychic energy trying to hide their scars? How many people spend all their mental effort trying to hide that with which they have been scarred? And then we see Jesus coming out of heaven and he says, see me, see me. He's not ashamed of those scars because those scars were sanctified because he suffered them for us. Those scars were sanctified because he passed through sin and he brought glory with those scars. He brought salvation. And for most of us, I believe it's the same thing. The scars that I have been through in my life will be reminders of where God's glory was allowed to come through mankind's sin. And the scars of your life will be where God's glory has allowed you to transform, to transcend, to overpower the scars that were there in life. And yet so many spend their whole time trying to hide the hurt and the dirt. Hide the age and the abuse. Hide the, the, the strain and the pain. Jesus says, don't hide and sanctify it. Give it to me. Let me show you what I can do with it. Let me show you where I can nail it. Let me show you the example that I can create of that which you are trying so desperately to hide and to make disappear in your own life. And then he showed them the deep scars. He wasn't ashamed. And neither when you're healed are you. Neither when I'm healed am I. I don't have to run from my past fears. I don't have to cringe from my past failures. Because God uses them as stepping stones to lead me on the river of life and to get me through. And after showing them the scars, Again, Jesus says, peace be unto you. I want to tell you something. God has only one message. Peace be unto you. If you decide you're going to live with a bad temper, you can't find the power of God. 
If you decide you've got a right to be angry at life, you can't find the power of God. See, he's only got one message, peace to you. And it starts inside me. And from the peace, I get a harmony with God that allows me to handle life. Verse 19, he says, peace be unto you. Verse 21, he says, peace be unto you. Verse 26, to Thomas, the doubter, who says everything wrong, peace be unto you. See, there's only one will for God. That's peace. Now, yeah, there has to be justice along with the mercy, but God wants peace in your heart. Come Armageddon, God is going to send an awful lot of messages falling from the heavens, burning and tearing the earth, but he has one simple message he's trying to get through, is peace be unto you. And the message of scripture is, but they would not repent their immorality, they would not repent their drug use, they would not repent that which they did. But God's basic message is peace. Peace with yourself, peace with your family, peace with your past, peace with your friends, peace with each other. And then he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. This was a personal thing to transform them. We need the Holy Spirit. That's why when I baptize, put my hand on the child and receive you the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Every pastor does that. Because that Baptismal regeneration, the washing and renewal of the Holy Spirit is what baptism is all about. You see, the primary point of Jesus breathing on them and saying, receive the Holy Spirit, was not to make Peter the Pope. The primary point of saying, receive ye the Holy Spirit, was not to make sure Peter became the primate. The purpose of receiving the Holy Spirit was to find forgiveness, so you should find peace. Peace came through forgiveness. Forgive from your heart. One of the most touching sermons I've ever heard was delivered here by one of our teachers on Good Friday. And he said, when we forgive, follow forgiveness. Are there the fruits of forgiveness? Are you cleansed so you can look, touch, talk, share, open up with these people? Brethren, receive the Holy Spirit and forgiveness. Whosoever sins you forgive. That's the heart of it for those of us in Jesus Christ. You see, God's resurrection shows eternal life to strengthen us for the infernal strife that we get put through in life. Verse 24, now comes a verse to us. Now Thomas called the twin. Twin means that there is double. And Thomas was double-minded. There's a lot of double-minded Christians in other churches out there. I know they're not here. There is a lot of double-minded Christians. Christians in those churches out there because they live life with cafeteria Christianity. I'll take some of this. I don't want any of that. I'll take some of this. I don't want any of that. Skip that. Skip that. Don't want that. No, 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 no. I just, I'll have three desserts and I'm out of here. Double-minded cafeteria Christianity live for success and then bleed for salvation. Live with the gospel of forgiveness, but without the law of obedience. Live with mercy, but missing the justice and the purity and the perfection of God. Living for the peace, but ignoring the truth that it takes to kiss that peace. And it's amazing because you see it in all churches that they're coming up with these sexual statements of what they are trying to take from the culture. They are trying to superimpose on the scripture. And they're trying to move it in there. And then they're trying to get God's people to believe and accept things that the Bible speaks of. I want 
to fit in comfortably with the culture in which I live. I want to be a part of this culture. At the same time, I am assured the blessed assurance. And so Thomas the Dowler, Thomas the Double-Minded, says, unless I see, I will not believe. Unless I take this finger and put it there, unless I take this hand and thrust it there, unless I do this, I will not believe. You know what Romans says? Romans says, faith cometh by hearing. Why does it say faith comes by hearing? Because if I hear something, it goes into my imagination, and then I have to imagine it, and I'm allowed to believe it. If I see it, it goes to another part of the brain, and I know it, and I show it, because that's the way it is. Faith cometh by hearing. Thomas never got faith. Thomas never got faith. He got knowledge. He suddenly saw Jesus, and he couldn't say, lay down, Lord, you're dead. He couldn't do that. But I want to tell you, Thomas was useful to Jesus because Thomas went through Babylon. Thomas went to India. Thomas built the church, and by the Middle Ages, that church was still standing, and those people were still bleeding all the way in the heart of India. They were bleeding the gospel of Jesus Christ that came from Thomas, who saw the resurrection. That's the kind of resurrection power that God has for his people. And a week later, Thomas was there, and the doors were still locked. Until you decide to burst out and to get into life and to move out, the doors will be locked. And then Jesus comes to Thomas, and he answers the unasked question. I love that. Jesus comes to Thomas. He doesn't say, Thomas, what do you want? He immediately gets the answer to Thomas that Thomas needs. Put your finger here. Put your hand here. Thomas, stop doubting. Stop doubting and believe. See, the resurrection of God shows us eternal life. And that eternal life stands against the infernal strife that they throw at us every day. And you and I have choices in life. We can choose for success. I've already read you a cultural definition of success. I was going to read it again, but I'm not going to. But just remember, in God's resurrection, eternal life stands against the eternal strife that you have to fight every day, every hour, every week of your life that sinful and fallen world. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your heart and your mind in Jesus Christ our Lord.
Amen. 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 The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give a praise and grace. Is it indeed right to give you our thanks and praise, O oh God? For you have given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In the first of your mighty deeds of power, you created the heavens and earth. You formed for yourself a people, and through the law and prophets, you led them on the road to life. Your child and your brother Jesus Christ came to us, speaking with words of peace and forgiveness. He was put to death by the enemies of life. But you kept your promise not to abandon your faithful one to death. He raised him up in freedom from death's power. Free to have his hands still scarred. He stands with us in our fears, doubt, and trial, and protects us through faith for salvation into our glorious inheritance, boundless joy in your sight forever. And so, with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the other witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, and with our loved ones, separate from us now, and yet in this mystery, and close to us, we adore and praise your glorious name, singing.
and preserve you in the one true faith and through life everlasting. Amen. Receive the peace, receive the power, receive the anointing presence of Jesus Christ. God's strength, God's healing. In with and under the bread of wine, receive the true body and blood of Jesus Christ. This be a healing of memories, a healing of emotions, a healing of relationships, and a healing of bodies. In Jesus Christ. May the true body strengthen and preserve you. May the true blood cleanse and empower you. Take me the true body of Jesus Christ. May he meet every need which is there in the born life. May the peace of passes all of your I speak a healing of memory and healing of emotion. I feel the true
fraternity. And my little sister was going to walk and raising money. She's uh, recently a single mom, and she wanted to get out and do something and meet other people, so she decided to train for this walk to go to the Grand Canyon to raise money for the King Society. So I'm like, you go, girl. I'm going to help you raise that money. But I was just going to give a donation, which I did. But in her sending out the letters to her friends to donate, she found out that one of our dear friends, which was Marty's little brother in fraternity, passed away in January. So, guess when that walk is? That walk is on his birthday. Yeah. And she was thinking, oh, I'm not going to do it. I'm like, Michelle, you have to do it. It's on his birthday. So she's walking in memory of him. And so you'll see some pictures. He was in her wedding, so is Michelle. So you'll see some pictures back there on the poster board. So you can see the people, some of the people that are helping and supporting. So thank you all very much, and God bless you all. I would remind you the deacons and the elders are at the altar if you would desire to pray. But thank God.